Okay, today we are going to um, see a new uh, author. He is not in fact a philosopher as such, but he is an, an important person when we discuss aesthetics. When we learn philosophy, we may not learn him, but when we learn philosophy of art, he becomes significant because of some, some particular reason. So we have Longinus, or he is known as, Pop, uh, known as Zuda Longinus or Longinus. And he is a scholar from 1st century AD. He wrote a book called Peri Upsos. Peri Upsos. So Longinus who wrote a book Peri Upsos and for that book he is very famous. Or, or he is important for students of art for the reason that he introduced a new notion of uh, a new aesthetic concept um, in his book called Peri Upsos. Peri Upsos, that's a Greek title. The author is Longinus or Pseudo Longinus. So why that Pseudo Longinus? He was considered as somebody who is Longinus, but later there was a problem with the authorship of the book, Periopsos. So when there was that problem, the later scholars found out a solution by adding Pseudo to his name. So we don't know if it is Longinus or if it is somebody else. It is a very important author uh, as far as the subject of aesthetics is concerned. Uh, so they, they added a um, um, adjective pseudo in front of his name or a suffix pseudo in front of his name. So it's a uh, manuscript, uh, it's a book which was written in 1st century AD and what is available is a 10th century manuscript of that book. So we don't, the, the original copy of his manuscript is not available. What is available is a 10th century manuscript of a book that was written in 1st century AD. Uh, and it was discovered in, uh, in the Renaissance period. And when this book was uh, discovered, uh, the scholars and the great men of that time got very interested in the book and the concept it presented. Uh, so this book was published again. So earlier when they were publishing the book, they found a name in the book. Uh, uh, means they, they found the author of the book to be Dionysius Longinus. They found the author of the book to be Dionysius Longinus. But later when they tried to edit the book again, they, they wanted to republish it again. They found it is written Dionysius or Longinus. So earlier it was considered to be Dionysius Longinus. Now they came to know that it is not Dionysius Longinus, it is written Dionysius or Longinus. So it can be, the author can be either Dionysius or Longinus. So, so there was a dilemma, who is the actual author? So in a manuscript when they copied, uh, the, the copywriter did not know who the actual author is. There was a confusion about that. So he wrote either it can be of Dionysius or it can be of Longinus. Though these names are available, we do not know uh, who actually those people, uh, that man was, who was the actual author of the book. So there were researches and inquiries to find out the actual author of the book Peri Upsos. Uh, so uh, some of them said it is Cassius Longinus. Some of them considered it as uh, Dionysius of Halicarnassus. Some others said it is by Plutarch. And many other names come in the list. Who could be the possible or probable author of this book. So Dionysius Longinus. Later they understood that it is Dionysius or Longinus. So there were scholars who were arguing that it is written by Dionysius of Halicarnassus or Cassius Longinus or it can be Plutarch or some other authors. Uh, finally they, they came to a conclusion, they, they settled at one name, it is Pseudo Longinus. Okay, Pseudo Longinus. So uh, still that dilemma or debate is there who the author is, but uh, we all agree at some Longinus, but we, don't know, we do not know who the actual author is. So the earliest surviving manuscript is from 10th century AD and it is printed in 1554 and it ascribes uh, th that first printing of this book is ascribed to Dionysius Longinus. Later it was noticed that the index to the manuscript read Dionysius or Longinus. So there, there is a problem of authorship that embroiled uh, the scholars for uh, the following centuries. And attempts were made to identify him with uh, people like Dionysius of Harlicarnassus, Cassius Longinus, Plutarch, means 
most of these people we know they, we know some other books of these authors uh, but it was not clear who the actual author was and finally it was settled on the name uh, Suda Lanjainus and this book is addressed to or it is dedicated to a Roman citizen a very cultured Roman figure a public figure but not much is not um, no, known about him his name is Postumius Tarantianus his name is Postumius Tarantianus it is dedicated to the whole treatise is dedicated to Postumius Tarantianus a cultured Roman figure uh, and, and a public figure uh, but nothing more is known about him so what we know about him is the reference to the reference in this very book of Peri Upsos uh, so very little is known about him otherwise so it is dedicated to a cultured Roman figure uh, a public figure uh, whose name is Postumius Tarantianus Peri Upsos is a compendium of exemplars with about 50 authors spanning a thousand years spanning 1000 years either mentioned or quoted so so it's a kind of literary criticism it's a kind of literary criticism so when he when he writes that uh, treatise he takes the examples of different authors uh, at least 50 authors are quoted or mentioned uh, and these authors span in a uh, millennium means uh, from BC um, 1000 to his own times so so it comes around 1000 years that that references comes from 1000 years of 50 authors uh, I means uh, most of them are Greek authors especially the authors like that of Homer and, and other figures in Greek literature so the treatise is dedicated to Postumius Tarantianus a cultured Roman and public figure though little else is known about him and on the sublime is a compendium of literary exemplars with about 50 authors spanning 1000 years mentioned or quoted along with, exam, uh, along with the expected examples from Homer and other figures in Greek literature. So one of the interesting things to be noted in, the, in this book is uh, he refers to the Old Testament Bible. The Old Testament Bible which was the holy book of Hebrews. Why it is interesting? It is interesting because at that point of time uh, the, the Hebrew community was a very small group of people uh, living in Middle East region. Um, so um, it was very rare in those days to have them quoted in some other place. You understand? So Lanjainus refers to a passage from Genesis which is the first book of uh, Old Testament which is quite unusual in first century. So I shall show you the text he is quoting. So Lanjainus refers to a passage from the book of Genesis which was very unusual during that time uh, to have quoted in such a book which is written in, uh, in such a place far from the place where the Jewish people lived. Actually, Jewish people were scattered in different parts of the world, uh, in, the, in the known world. Uh, so, uh, looking at this reference, it's a positive reference to Old Testament or, or the book of Genesis. Uh, he writes that similarly, the legislator of the Jews, no ordinary man, he is referring to Moses. Having formed and expressed a worthy conception of the might of the Godhead, writes at the very beginning of his law. God said, What? Let there be light and there was light. Let there be land and there was land. So the, the letters given in red color in quotation that is actually the citation from Old Testament Bible, the book of Genesis. Um, so so it, is a, it is with reference to Moses, we are not certain if it was actually written by uh, Moses. The hands of so many authors can be found in the book of Genesis which was later edited and joined as one book. Uh, so, so this reference, this positive reference which is found in uh, Peri Upsos points to the authorship um, that it could be the author of the book could be a Hellenized Jew or somebody who is readily familiar with the Jewish culture and their scripture. Okay, ha having this reference being uh, found in such a book uh, means most of the references are from Greek authors and this is on a, from a Hebrew text. For that reason, 
he could be a hellenized jew or some scholars who is readily uh, informed about the or familiar with the jewish culture and their religion and when you look at the book uh, he can be understood as uh, he is not a philosopher that's why we don't learn him learn anything about him in philosophy when i did my philosophy course i have never found this name plunginus uh, probably because he is uh, more a literary critic than a philosopher he was a literary critic than a philosopher and um, one of the great seminal works on literary criticism one of the earliest works found in that genre of literary criticism and and the book is centered around the themes on aesthetics and also the benefit benefits of strong writing the the themes of aesthetics and also the benefits of strong writing so lanjainus tries to analyze the different literature available then and tries to uh, lay out some principles or norms with which a writing can be strong or weak uh, so he considers some writings from uh, some thousand years before him and the purpose of writing this book is uh, very important as far as we are concerned uh, there he introduces a term can you guess what it is do you have any knowledge about this man or his con uh, contribution to the field of aesthetics do you have any clue actually when I, when i when we read him what i felt was uh, he is important only for one thing he introduced a particular word nothing more than that he introduced a particular concept in a word and that word becomes very popular later in renaissance and also in the later centuries and even today that is very relevant but the the insight he he gives about that word is not very deep it's very shallow actually actually the later philosophers in the modern times uh, explored that concept and they provide that the modern philosophers actually provides us uh, more important theories on uh, that theme yeah the sublime sublime the concept of sublime comes from lanjainus before that that concept was not there so it's a new term in aesthetics at this time nobody uses such a term nobody introduces such a concept before he before lanjainus does it actually when we look at him chronologically he comes before plotinus but uh, we consider him later because i wanted you to have a synoptic understanding of the mimetic theory of art that's why we considered plato aristotle and plotinus but this man comes before him in the first century ad itself uh, as we already know plotinus is in third century ad so so i did not follow the chronological order because i wanted to uh, have our lectures based on a theme so we were looking at the mimetic theory of art in the previous classes and now we are trying to look at the concept of sublime which this man introduces so when he writes the book his sole intention is uh, people have to follow these principles or, or people have to understand uh, what is sublime so they have to achieve sublime okay the goal according to longinus is to achieve the sublime so he does this by analyzing both strong and weak points uh, in the works which is found in uh, past 1000 years so what makes a writing strong what makes a uh, epic strong or weak okay so so in the in the previous writing what makes it strong or weak that was his consideration and it is written in epistolary form epistolary epistolary form is something written in the form of a letter or a journal entry something written in the form of a letter or journal entry so on the sublime is written in the form of a journal entry or a or a letter addressing posthumus tarantianus uh, it can be a combination of both also it can either be in the form of a letter or journal entries or it can be both together and there is a missing part of the book which is not available to us the final part which is reportedly handling the theme of the topics of public speaking oratory or rhetoric Uh, so that part is not available to us once he introduced the term uh, it was in oblivion for so long and this book was rediscovered in the in the 16th century in the beginning of the 16th century this book was rediscovered and as we already said it was printed in 1554 and ever since it was discovered and it was printed this book and the concept became very popular in the renaissance period in baroque period in romantic period 
in in the all the following periods of uh, art it becomes very important that's why we consider him uh, but his own writing was very shallow it was not an in depth understanding of the concept sublime as we understand today in the later centuries in the modern philosophy we find arthur schopenhauer immanuel kant edmund burke and many other philosophers consider this theme of sublime and gives an gives us an in depth understanding of the concept of the sublime and we will be looking at some of them uh, as we uh, follow our course in the next semester so his importance is only because of the fact that he introduced the term the sublime so another aesthetic term that originated in the antiquity but it was made famous by subsequent adaptations especially by schopenhauer immanuel kant edmund burke and and the people like that original and unique contribution of lenjainus to the field of aesthetics is the sublime the sublime and unique contribution of lenjainus to the field of aesthetics is the sublime the sublime and what do you understand by sublime can anyone say what is sublime people are responding in the chat box you can either respond in the chat box or unmute and speak for yourself it's a divine quality vasudev says it is a divine quality shamira says transcendental uh when father when we studied it in painting it's something like um a terror like very strong emotions or uh like vast expanse of uh nature okay yeah last year even i myself referred to the concept of sublime uh, if you remember when i was teaching 19th century western art romanticism i i, I discussed this theme i guess did i uh, yes yes we did okay 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 what we discussed in our class last year was the romantic sublime means the understanding of the sublime during the romantic period that that concept has developed far from the time of longinus himself so so i i will just tell you uh, usually we understand something as beautiful ugly good or bad that is the general understanding there, there are certain things that do not come in the particular definition of beautiful or ugly good or bad in that kind of discussions it can it cannot be included i can bring forward a few examples uh, do you know buddha you, i hope i don't i should not ask you do you know buddha uh, you know who is buddha but what is his previous life in his early life what was his name in the early life his name was siddhartha and we all know he was born in a uh, royal family and what was his problem he was born in a royal family very rich family Uh, he was a prince being in a royal family he would have everything that is required for somebody uh, who needs to be content and happy in life isn't it when we look at our personal experience when we have everything around us uh, 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 when we have everything that makes us happy around us usually such things would be uh, means uh, for me a mobile would be very interesting a car would be very uh, important thing for me Uh, or, or anything that is necessary for us for our daily life food and other other facilities that are required for us good internet connection if everything is there we are happy enough money is there we are happy and in his own times he never uh, he, he would be given everything he would have been provided everything that he may not want anything more further you understand he was given everything and the parents uh, siddhartha's parents found him still unhappy right and what they thought getting him married would make him more happy he he was found unhappy and the girl was given in marriage to him and they thought he would be happy was he happy so everything is there uh, uh, he he got married to a beautiful woman uh, he had every riches uh, at his command everything was there but was he happy actually Was he happy? No, no, he wasn't. What What is the reason for he not being happy? Every everything that gives him pleasure in the worldly life was provided to him. When we compare to our own lives, it is true that uh, when everything pleasurable be pleasurable is there in, around us, we are normally happy. Was he not normal or what? Yeah, he was quite abnormal, a little abnormal. and we look at from our perspective what was his problem 
So every good things were provided to him, but that did not make him happy. He gave up everything and, and lived a life of a mendicant. And also uh, he, he was searching for something uh, more than uh, he was searching for a higher kind of pleasure, uh, which these things could not give him. Uh, a wife could not give him that pleasure. Uh, any riches could not give him that pleasure. Any food could not give him that pleasure. So he was looking for a greater pressure. So giving up everything in the world in order to attain something that is higher. You understand? That suggests to what sublime is. So things are beautiful. Everything beautiful, everything good is given to him. But he is not satisfied with any of them. But he tries to achieve something higher. What is beyond everything beautiful, what is beyond everything that is good. You understand? There are certain elements which we cannot comprehend with the term beautiful or good. So there is something that goes beyond of, of, of a higher quality than considering as good or beautiful. Uh, that is what uh, this man points to. Langinos points to. Okay, one more story I can tell you. Better I shall share the script. Can someone uh, say the story? I will share a text. Somebody may please come forward and uh, read. Who, who will do it? It's a small passage. Someone please volunteer. Okay, Father. Who? Noila? No. The book of Job is quite possibly the strangest book in the Hebrew Bible and is notoriously difficult to date. In this Bible story from the book of Job, there is a wealthy man named Job residing in an area called Uz with his extended family and vast flocks. He is blameless and upright, constantly mindful to live in a righteous manner. God brags to Satan about Job's virtue, but Satan contends that Job is only righteous because God has favored him generously. Satan dares God that, if given the approval to inflict suffering, Job will, will change and curse God. God permits Satan to abuse Job, to experiment with this brazen claim, but he forbids Satan to take Job's life in the manner. Over the time of one day, Job is given four reports, each informing him that his sheep, servants and ten children have all died due to thieving intruders or natural disasters. Job rips his clothes and shaves his head in sorrow, yet he still praises God in his prayers. Satan arrives in heaven again and God allows him another op opportunity to test Job. This time, Job is distressed with terrible skin sores. His wife urges him to denounce God and to give up and die. But Job protests, trying to endure his inflictions. This is actually a summary of the book of Job. Summary of the book of Job that comes in the Old Testament Bible. And what you see in the book is, uh, Job, he was a very rich and wealthy, he was a very wealthy man given everything around him. Uh, and as you, uh, as it was read there, um, th there are there are instances when he loses everything. So one of the servants come back and says, all your sheep is lost. Some robbers came and robbed all of them. And, and, and the servants were killed. I am only I am the one who is left in order to give this report to you. Then what the response of Job is? It was all given by God. It was it is all taken back by God. Let His name be glorified. Let His name be blessed. All His children were lost. It means in an accident, uh, everyone were lost. All His children and family was lost. Uh, and one of the servants come back and says. All of them are lost. Only I am left in order to give this report to you. Then he says, the children were given by God and they are take, called back by God. So let his name be blessed. You understand? It, it is beyond human conception. Generally, when we lose something, we are very upset. Okay. Uh, when we lose something, we are very upset and uh, not happy. We will be blaming God. And he finally falls sick. And he has a lot of sores on his body. Even his wife rejects him. And asks him to curse God and uh, get, get away. 
curse God and die. That will be better than living a life like this. But he says, it's a will of God. I accept it. I thank God. I glorify God. So that was his only response. He endured all these sufferings. You understand? So actually this is a book which uh, tries to examine the problem of evil. If God is almighty, if, if God is all good, why there is evil in the world? And the book answers that it is beyond human comprehension. The plan of God, the will of God is beyond our comprehension. God has his own ways of doing things. And his three friends come uh, for a counsel to him. And they, and they say that you must have committed some crime. You must, have, you must have committed some sin against God. That's why God, you are put in front of God's justice. Okay, you are put to justice by God because you have committed some crimes. Committed sins that are not uh, not worthy to God. You understand? But he says, uh, no, he know how righteous he was. And he was so confident. He was so prayerful. He was so thankful to God even for the sufferings that was given to him. Sufferings that were given to him. So, can you just imagine? Uh, we can thank somebody for some good things. When you are given a gift, you will be thanking them, right? When you are given a pen, you will be thanking. When you are, uh, if, But if you are beaten up, will you thank him back? If you are inflicted some pain, you will be blaming. Gali dega. You understand? You will be, you will be uh, blaming them. Or telling bad, bad words about them. Somebody who gives you pain. Somebody who makes you sorrow. You will be upset with them. You will not be happy with them. You understand? That is very natural. That is very human. But a uh, uh, thought beyond the human kind of thought. I don't say it is not human because these are all human thoughts only but um, generally we don't think in that manner. So some thought is higher than what every other should think. A thought that is of a higher order. A thought that is of a higher order. When when you are beaten up you give thanks. When you are when you are blamed or when you are when you are blamed without any reason. When you are when you are uh, mocked by everyone else. You are thanking God and thanking others for doing that. Doing that very thing that inflicts pain on you. That's not a natural thought. That it is not generally, generally it is not the way that human beings respond. We will be reacting in a different way. So it is beyond general understanding of people. It is beyond general understanding of human nature. Is, is that clear to you? So that kind of thought he considers as uh, the sublime. And I will conclude the story. In the end it goes like this. God gives everything back to him. Bless him with everything that was his. Uh, means he was given children again. Uh, he was given family again. Wealth again. And he lived happily ever after. That's how the story ends. Uh, but uh, it discusses a problem. Discusses the philosophical and theological problem of evil. Uh, at a very early period. So for Lanjainus. The sublime is an adjective that describes great or elevated or lofty thought or language. So it's a lofty thought or language. That's why you are saying this example. It is, it is beyond normal human comprehension. It is not very natural to human being to respond in that way. So it's a thought of higher order, a feeling of higher order. So he is, think, he is saying it's about elevated language or thought. So he defines sublime as an adjective that describes great, elevated or lofty thought or language. So it can be thought or language which is elevated, lofty or great. And as such sublime inspires awe and veneration. So when, when we speak about Buddha or when we listen to the story of Job, so their attitude is something venerable, something that, uh, something that invokes awe. We cannot think in that manner. That is something new to us. We have never thought in such manner. How can you thank you somebody uh, who is inflicting pain on you? Some, how can you thank you somebody uh, who steals away your things? You know uh, the story of Bishop Bishop's candlesticks. Do you lay miserables? You know that story I guess. The thief takes the candlesticks of the bishop and runs away. It's by Victor Hugo. Uh, he, he runs away with the candle. And the police catch him and bring him back to the bishop. And the bishop says, 
uh, uh, bishop say, the police ask him he has stolen your candlesticks we have brought him back then the bishop says I have given it to him and why brother I had given you one more thing you did not take that why didn't you take that so that kind of thought is an elevated thought it's a lofty thought you understand so that is what Lanjainus considers as sublime was written as a response to a book which was written by Caecilius of Calacte. Caecilius of Calacte. Uh, so Caecilius of Calacte. This book is written in response to uh, Caecilius of Calacte. So for Langinus, the sublime is an adjective that describes great, elevated or lofty thought or language, particularly in the context of rhetoric. The last part of the book was dealing with the rhetorics but it is not available to us anymore uh, so he has written in the context of rhetoric and as such sublime inspires awe and veneration with greater persuasive powers so when we hear such a story when we hear such a rhetoric it, it persuades us to do something means oh I, I, I was not doing it in the right way I could have done it better so uh, I could think in that manner so that kind of thoughts follows uh, when we listen to some sort of talks like that or, or when you read some stories like that. Caecilius of Calacte is a Sicilian rhetorician and it was in response to him this book was written. That is how the dating of the book is done. Okay, we had a problem with the authorship who wrote it actually. Finally, it was understood that it was written in response to a, a book written by Caecilius of Calacte. That's why we place him in 1st century AD because it's a 1st century rhetorician. Uh, and, and one of the important thing about uh, the concept of sublime by Longinus is uh, Longinus defines sublimity in Greek it is ipsos in lit sublimity in literature as the echo of greatness of spirit echo of greatness of spirit that is his definition his proper definition the echo of greatness of spirit so what is significant there what is what is the importance of the definition the echo of greatness of spirit so sublimity is the echo of greatness of spirit. So whose spirit is referred to here? Whose greatness of spirit is echoed in a literature? You understand the idea? Do you get me? So when I write a book, my spirit is echoed there. You understand? When Victor Hugo writes Les Miserables, the greatness of the spirit of Victor Hugo is echoed in the work Les Miserables. You understand? So, the moral imaginative power of the writer pervades the work of art. Whether it is literature or any other work. The moral and imaginative power of the author or writer becomes very important. So, he is somebody who refers to that in, in an early period. Echo of greatness of spirit. So, so there is a significant... When Plato writes... It is the greatness of Plato's spirit is accord in his works. When, when uh, Victor Hugo writes, it is the greatness of the spirit of Victor Hugo pervades the work of Victor Hugo. So that is an interesting observation in the first century. So the greatness in the literature is this, uh, ascribed to the qualities innate in the writer rather than in the art. The moral and imaginative power of the writer pervades the work. Thus, for the first time, greatness in literature is ascribed to the qualities innate in the writer rather than in the art. You understand? That is the significance of his definition of sublime. So, it is for the first time, greatness in literature is ascribed to the qualities of the artist or the qualities of the writer rather than in art or the book. And um, he continues to describe sublime, sublime. Sublimity is a certain distinction and excellence in expression. And that it is from no other source than this that the greatest poets and writers have derived their eminence and gained immortality of renown. Sublimity is a certain distinction and excellence in expression. And that it is from no other source than the greatest poets and writers have derived their eminence and gained immortality of renown. So, uh, it is from sublimity that greatest poets and writers 
gain their immortality and renown uh, when you look at homer when you look at victor hugo or when you look at any he refers to certain works of uh, literary men uh, in the thousand years preceded him uh, and he he uses the examples from past thousand years and explains this the sublimity it's a it's an excellence in expression so there are so many writers who come in last thousand years but few of them excel in the way they express in in the in the concept they uh, give to us so so that the source of that excellence is sublimity which is a certain distinction and excellence and uh, there are so many or oh, there there are so many artists but we remember a very few of them for example when i say renaissance who is the artist who is coming to your mind when i refer to renaissance who is the artist who comes to your mind please speak and uh, noella said michael angelo okay michael angelo and any others when i say renaissance tell one, one or two names michael angelo of course we all know means michael angelo da vinci raphael uh, these are some of the names that come to our mind actually uh, da vinci so uh, leonardo da vinci michael angelo uh, so uh, what i remember is uh, when i was in the school i knew only these three guys as renaissance artists only after coming to the uh, fine arts field i i understood that there are so many other artists from that time but why these people are known in such a way than others they had a certain distinction they had a certain excellence of expression in their works in different ways so i will show you an image now do you see this who is this da vinci yeah it's da vinci a flying machine yeah it's a work of da vinci and why it is something very significant it's a, it's from the sketchbook of da vinci why it is so significant uh, because he was trying to design uh, and something that could fly yeah he was trying to design something that fly at a time when no other people could even imagine it maybe it was in stories and all about people flying but no one thought that it is possible no one imagined that it is possible okay no one would expect that is actually possible they may dream of it they may think of it but he tried to actualize that dream you understand provided he had he was living in the uh, modern times he would have made it fly you understand so such a genius is there so he was very different very different from every other artist and other other people and, and what about this one already we saw these paintings and things uh, last year what is this what are you seeing uh, the sistine chapel by my sistine chapel by michelangelo uh, so what is the relevance of this why it is so significant and different from other artists again nobody thought that such a painting would be possible there no no one could even imagine uh, this is possible actually this was commissioned to michelangelo uh, because uh, in the background some others were, were uh, playing against him because michelangelo was a renowned sculptor so some people thought that if he goes on doing some of the other projects which is interested to him commissioned to him he would become famous his name will live forever than theirs so they wanted to do they wanted michelangelo to do such a thing which they thought it would be a failure because you know uh, this this is not a plain surface and it is on a too high a place it is on the ceiling which is too high and it is very difficult to paint there and also there are architectural elements uh, in the in the in the there are architectural elements that you find find in the ceiling so it is very difficult to paint that plane it is a curved surface and when we come down it may not look correct if it when it is in a curved surface so michelangelo uh, did something that was imagine considered impossible his achievement was something impossible uh, to human thought and and, and you see some other painter rafael rafael 
the school of athens we already saw this and discussed these paintings in the last year so so uh, there is a there is a sort of symmetry uh, and there is a sort of believability it is a believable room but you know the characters presented there they lived in different parts of the world not in the same place and they were never uh, a part of academy except a few guys and they lived in different times but he created a, a painting uh, which could be believed by anyone so so uh, that that's an innovation by rafael okay and there are also other artists this is masaccio here the achievement of masaccio is it's about perspective when you look at the perspective that he has achieved last year i have shown that image to you actually when you go and look at this painting you feel like it is actually a window opening to the world and and uh, inside uh, in, inside the niche there is a crucifix actually hanging there so the perspective the quality of perspective he achieved in this painting is um, incredible you understand so so they they, they excel others in some way again i can show you some other images also this one actually this one also uh, means uh, i'll just speak about this painting a bit i i we already discussed these paintings in last year i guess um i don't know if it was me or some other teachers who did this part uh, i started from the higher renaissance i guess um, so so if you look at this painting uh, piero della francesca when i ask who are the renaissance artists uh, we never referred to him uh, but we know as students of art we might know but other people may not know piero della francesca it's also an excellent painting but there is something lacking here which by the time of da vinci rafael bernini those people have achieved it okay uh, so what is lacking here the perspective is perfect if you look at the perspective it is perfect but the what is lacking here is its flagellation it is very static the, the flagellation is a means it's a very painful moment there is no emotion attached to the painting it's very very um, what we say it, it is more intellectual or more scientific than emotional the scientific perspective perspective is perfect if you look at the coffer if you look at the uh, designs on the four moving backwards uh, the three men discussing there and uh, christ and other people who are whipping him are standing around uh, pontius pilate is there so it is title flagellation but the actual flagellation has gone to the background it has no prominence it, and it is uh, it, it is lacking some emotion and again uh, there is another painting by piero della francesca resurrection again this is also a moment it is one of the most important moments of christianity actually this is the moment where, from where christianity actually begins so this is the most important charisma of faith um for the christianity so it is from where the christianity begins like all the apostles were preaching the resurrection of christ in the beginning not about the birth not about the life not about the passion but it was resurrection if there was no resurrection there was no christianity so this is the crucial moment of christianity most important moment of christianity but look at the painting again like somebody who uh, means i cannot uh, do any acting here Uh, people are sleeping there uh, and somebody from a backdrop comes up uh, and stands there with a flag so emotionless when you consider you understand but technically there is a perfection as far as perspective is concerned as far as uh, the the uh, when you look at the um, anatomy there is a clinical perfection more cerebral in representing the forms uh, the, the it is more cerebral than emotional i hope you are able to understand the point i am trying to make is some artists are preferred over others because of some kind of excellence because of some kind of distinction and that distinction comes from the quality of sublimity so that is the source of sublimity is the source of that distinction and excellence that is found in some artists according to longinus in fact longinus lived far before these people but we are taking these examples because Uh, probably these works were done in a time when this book was rediscovered 
So again, coming back to the description, uh, sublimity is a certain distinction and excellence in expression and that it is from no other source than this that greatest poets and writers have derived their eminence and gained immortality of renown. So we looked at a few artists of renaissance period and tried to understand this description of sublime by uh, Lungainus. And he goes on to say, the effect of elevated language upon the audience is not of persuasion but of transport. Our persuasions we can usually control. But the influences of the sublime bring irresistible might to bear. You will not be able to control. So if somebody tried to persuade you, okay, you can think for yourself. He is trying to make me buy this thing. A, a marketing man comes to your home and tries to sell something. He tries to persuade you. But you can resist it. You understand? You can resist the words of a marketing uh, employee. Maybe somebody calls you and say, Sir, there is a new product that we uh, that we uh, present in the market. This is good. And he uh, puts up all the good qualities of uh, that particular product in front of you in a very, very interesting way. Still, you can resist. He is, because it is an attempt to persuade you. The effect of elevated language is not of persuasion. It is of transport. You will not be able to resist the might of that uh, feeling. You, you get the difference. The influences of the sublime brings irresistible might. But when somebody tries to persuade you, you can resist. You can stop. You can choose whether to buy or not to buy a product that is in front of your door. So the effect of elevated language upon the audience is not of persuasion but of transport. And he is also speaking in the light of rhetoric. Most of the time he is also referring to rhetoric. So when you listen to a good rhetoric, you may forget yourself. Your reason is lost. Uh, maybe I will to give you two examples. Means One of them is uh, in 2015, there was a uh, Oxford Union speech by Shashi Theruran. It was viral on internet. And, and the uh, theme of it, it was a debate actually in which Shashi Tharoor spoke for some 8 minutes. He was the 7th seventh, seventh speaker of his group and that 8 minute speech was viral. You can google and find out the speech for yourself. You can just google Oxford Union speech Shashi Tharoor. It was in 2015. Um, so the motion they were trying to pass was this house believes Britain owes reparation to her former colonies. Britain owes reparation to her former colonies. Has anyone heard that? I am just curious. Have you heard that speech? Anybody in the class? It was viral a few years ago. Even now it pops up sometimes. Has anyone heard? Shashi Tharoor Union, uh, Oxford Union speech. Yeah, Mathulika says she has heard it. Maybe, maybe you have heard it. Uh, but uh, uh, um, I am not going to the speech. You can google and listen for yourself. Uh, so, so the end result was actually the house was um, against this motion but after Shashi Tharoor presented his arguments after his rhetoric the motion was passed in favor uh, in the end Tharoor side win 185 votes against 56 so in the beginning the mind was different they had a different verdict in the beginning but towards the end of his speech everyone agreed that Britain owes reparation to her former colonies I hope this example is clear enough the effect of a rhetoric in the mind of the audience and, and sublime has a number of specific effects for which Lanjainus calls upon the readers to search and he gives um, he lists out them as laws of rationality deep emotion combined with pleasure and alienation so laws of rationality deep emotion combined with pleasure and alienation there are also other kinds of rhetorics uh, I would refer to um, if you remember Three years ago, there was something that something that happened in India.
that kind of rhetoric was there and people in general i don't say everyone maybe there are people who did uh, use reason and understood it but it could take away the reason of certain people and uh, deep emotion combined with pleasure and alienation if you listen to some of the uh, religious um, rhetoric some some uh, motivation speakers or or people uh, s- some kind of gurus when they speak uh, or when they do something on the stage uh, there is a kind of uh, deep emotion that uh, uh, resonates in our mind or, or some kind of pleasure and alienation that we feel uh, some charismatic preachers or religious preachers very often use that kind of techniques there's a trick is in such a way that they can uh, lead people to deep emotion with pleasure and alienation so these all could be the examples of sublime uh, there are both positive and negative elements that i discussed examples i discussed but uh, you understand the notion of sublime according to uh, longinus or, or another example a visual example could be suppose i i would uh, maybe in the one of one of the earlier classes i must have refer i might have referred to it um once uh, during my college days uh, one of my uh, two of my juniors came with me to my home and they stayed at my home and i took them to a waterfall adirappalli falls i don't know if someone someone has visited that and i don't know if somebody is listening from kerala um there is a movie ravan uh, ravan i should hear you you remember a movie ravan and you see aishwarya aishwarya rai falling from a waterfall in a forest have you seen anybody remembers ah uh, yeah some, some i don't know if everyone has seen that film and that is the adirappalli falls that is the place i am referring to so i took them there and it was i don't know if somebody knows it was rafian and gangotri rafian and gangotri was with me and we went there and uh, they wanted to go to the bottom of the uh, bo- to the bottom of the waterfall we went there and we were uh, seeing the waterfall and and after a while i found her i found gangotri standing on a rock standing on a tall rock and we all went there went behind her and we i also climbed and she has stretched her arms to the waterfall and she is uttering sublime we can't actually hear i i went close to her and i listened to her she is saying sublime she has forgotten everything she does not uh, know what is happening around her so it is a very beautiful experience I, we cannot say beautiful actually much more than that so it's a she loses reason she loses loses a thought of where she is okay uh, what she is doing she is not caring for anybody who is there so so that kind of experience a kind of alienation you understand so that is what uh, lanjanus mean by sublime lanjanus simplifies these effects by stating that a strong writer will not focus on his own emotions or trying to convey his emotions rather to cause the reader to feel those emotions for himself a strong writer will not try to convey that emotions convey his own emotions to the reader instead to he will be able to uh, cause in the reader the same kind of emotions he uh, goes through you understand the difference he is not trying to convey the emotion instead he makes the reader feel those emotions the same way the writer feels it do have you seen the film dangal dangal yes father okay do you remember the climax of the film dangal what is the climax how it ends do you remember were you emotional when you were seeing that film in the climax were you emotional i don't know i am a man who cries when i see a film i would cry uh, uh, so i was crying towards the end of the film i was happy but i was crying you get do you remember the climax i i will just summarize it the, during the uh, final match her father is not able to come and uh, her father who is her actual coach is able to reach the stadium but the problem is that the uh, professional coach was very angry with her father and uh, he was not happy with her father coaching her and the actual co- the, the professional coach locks up her father in the uh, latrin area toilet area and he is inside and actually she wants her father to be her side when she is fighting the match and she is looking for her and she is going to fail 
going to going to lose the match and in a, in a moment before a few seconds before the match is going to conclude with her failure with her loss she remembers her lessons from her father flashback goes he says you have to fight for yourself when i am not i will not be there all the time with you and she fights and she makes some moves and he, she clinches the match from her opponent and at the same time the father is too upset in the toilet block where he is locked up and she does not know what happened in the um, ring where the fighting the, the wrestling is going on and there is a moment when when the national anthem comes the, when the national anthem is recited national anthem you know it is recited for the gold winner gold medal winner so when the indian national anthem is heard uh, that that emotion cannot be conveyed means uh, nobody need to convey it to you it comes from your own, your own mind your own heart you understand so lanjana simplifies these effects by stating that strong writer will not focus on his own emotions or, or try to convey these emotions to the reader instead he will cause the reader to feel those emotions uh, again we see skill in invention and due order and arrangement of matter emerging as a hard won result not of one thing or of not uh, not of one thing nor of two but of the whole texture of composition whereas sublimity is flashing forth at the right moment and scatters everything before it like a thunderbolt so so skill is something uh, uh, that 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 you find with um, any invention or any arrangement of means when you do a work of art there is a skill the skill the difference between skill and sublimity the skill is there for all of us for any artist or any inventor or any writer the skill is there he has to have that skill of writing in order to write but sublime it happens in a moment in in the right moment and perverts and it comes like a thunderbolt so if you look at a good rhetoric rhetoric if you look at a good piece of literature at a certain moment it it comes and perverts you and that is actually a gift rather than a skill you understand when the effect of sublimity comes and perverts it it shows the power of the orator and its plenitude so when we listen to some of the speeches uh, it will give us goosebumps when when we listen to somebody or when you read some poetry or when you see a movie when you see a drama it it gives you goosebumps at a particular moment it, it comes and affects you from inside or it may break you into tears or it it will instill hope in you when you are in, when you are broken you understand so so it is possible for the for for sublime when the quality of the sublime is there in the author or writer or, or, or an artist or a rhetorician it can it can do wonders in any rhetorician will have the skill to speak in front of an audience but certain rhetoricians with the quality of the sublime will have that power to give you goosebumps or break you into tears or instill hope in you when you are lost that is the difference between skill and sublimity etymological meaning of the word it actually comes from latin like we so many other words also so sub that suffix means up to sub in latin it's a suffix that means up to and limus means oblique or limen means threshold so it is by joining that suffix and limus or limen that word comes in english sublime so it means dignified or something that is standing alone or oblique you know it's a it's a standing uh, thing so so it takes you up it is something that is capable of taking you up so that is how the meaning of the word comes the literal etymological meaning limen or limus these could be the words from which uh, the, these words adding to sub gives the word sublime 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 is in latin sublime in english okay so uh, 
there are five principal sources of elevated language which he discusses after going through that we will be concluding the session there are five principal sources of elevated language so one is greatness of thought second is vigorous treatment of passions and the third is skill in employing figures of thought and figures of speech and fourth is noble diction and fifth is majesty and elevation of structure so these are the five principal sources of elevated thought or elevated language or are the sources of sublime the greatness of thought what is the greatness of thought we said so many examples so you understand what is the greatness of thought i would i would say one more example so uh, some, the the greatness of thought com, uh, consists in the power of forming great conceptions he gives an example of xenophon i will give you an example of surdas do you know surdas have you heard of surdas those who learned hindi they must have learned a poem any poetry of surdas he he comes from the period of uh, bhakti movement uh, so so there are so many uh, hymns from him uh, in praise of krishna so um, surdas was a 15th century poet and do you know what is what is special about him what is his peculiarity anybody knows what is special about surdas yeah he was blind madhulika knows it so he was a blind poet and i have read a story about him uh, he was blind and and he was very devoted to krishna and in an in an incident at the end of an incident he had the vision of krishna he had the vision of krishna so krishna appeared to him and he gave him eyesight in order that he see krishna in order to see krishna he was given eyesight and krishna appearing in front of him asked him what is the boom that you want he asked surdas uh, to ask anything ask for any boon so he uh, krishna is god and surdas is his devotee so uh, i i will give you anything that you ask for ask any boon from me you know what was the answer by this blind poet surdas oh lord i have seen you my my greatest wish is accomplished and i don't want to see anything else with my eyes that saw you so make me blind again you understand so make me blind again so that i will not see anything other than you the only vision the one and only vision i have with my eyes is that is of my lord krishna i don't want to see anything else so it's a great thought so the power of conceiving such thoughts is very important the power of conceiving that kind of thought is required in order, in order to attain greatness of thought the power of forming great conceptions the second one is vigorous treatment of passion vigorous treatment of passion so uh, vehement and inspired passion actually he refers to two kinds of passion and not all kinds of passion lead you to sublime because there are passions of a higher order and of a lower order so passions of a higher order and of a lower order the passion of a lower order is that of pity fear uh grief such things are passions of lower order so passions of higher order leads you to the sublime and and the first two the greatness of thought and vigorous treatment of passion these two components of sublime which is in a poet or artist is for most part it is innate so the the power of conceiving great thoughts great ideas uh, that is very innate and also uh the the passion that is also innate the passions of higher order that is also innate that there are also examples of sublime even without uh, being so passionate he gives some examples from homer so there are certain uh, examples of sublime which are independent of passion which you find in homer so that's about passion the first two the first two are the greatness of thought and vigorous treatment of passions there are passions of higher order and lower order Uh, the passions of lower order uh, never leads to sublime it is far removed from sublimity and of a lower order such as pity fear grief and such emotions such passions and there are also sub, uh, examples of sublime independent of passion he gives the example of homer 
and the third one is skill in employing figures of thought and figures of speech the skill in employing figures of thought and figures of speech the due formation of figures deals with two sorts of figures those of thought and also those those of expression uh, in your thought you have you have figures of thought and also figures of speech e- expression you express your thought through either speech or writing or, or uh, when, when it comes to artists they express it by painting installation sculpture and and many other methods so uh, they they should be able to use proper figures of speech proper examples they have to use in order to represent an idea that is in their mind and the fourth one is noble diction that is about dignified expression the appropriate choice of words and metaphors use of metaphors and elaboration of language so certain things it will be boring when you listen to some lectures it will it will appear so boring but a certain certain uh, lectures will be very interesting because there are so many stories or examples uh, or there are certain things that catches your attention the appropriate choice of words and metaphors and the elaboration of language and the fifth one is majesty and elevation of the structure a dignified and elevated composition is a fitting conclusion for all the aspect that preceded it so uh, the the first four the greatness of thought the vigorous treatment of passion skill in employing figures of thought and figures of speech and noble diction when everything is accomplished the fitting conclusion is a maj- the majesty and elevation of the structure the, the whole structure it will have an elevated position the sublime Uh, is elevated thought or language the last clause actually embraces all the preceding ones this is where I, i wanted to show you that film i i was showing you a film brother son sister moon in the beginning brother son sister moon it's the it's the story of saint francis have you heard of cousin sakis he is a greek uh, no, novelist there is a novel called saint francis written by him and actually this is not from that novel that film comes it's a story of saint francis of assisi i will briefly say what 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 i wanted you to see actually so what i wanted to see from the movie was some of you saw already some of you are yet to see um so francis undergoes some kind of depression and his parents want him to be recovered uh, and they are praying for him they are waiting for that and once he is recovered he is the only son of those parents very rich parents who are textile merchants in italy Uh, in acc so uh, what what you see is his father francis father actually want to address the entire entire business of his to saint francis so francis is going to inherit uh, all the riches of his father all the uh, business of his father but he is not happy like you saw in the case of buddha though everything is given to him and he can well marry the that beautiful woman who was lover uh, her name is claire so she he can marry her also but he is not happy about any such things uh, somewhere he finds uh, something lacking and actually when he sees uh, the the servants or, or the slaves who is working in the textile factory uh, um, in the textile production unit of his father uh, he feels for them he feels an empathy for them and and wherever he go when he, whenever he goes out he sees very so many poor people and he his heart uh, his heart is uh, his heart has a longing for them so what he does is one day uh, he goes to the um, textile showroom of his father and and he is beating him up he is brutally beaten up and his mother cries out uh, and he is taken to the bishop who is, who is also acting as a judge in the city so that is the film uh, that you saw and actually the film is a beautiful film a very old film i collected from some other sources the the print the quality of the film is a little bad but the film is very beautiful uh, franco seferelli so i will take you to one more clip means i i will take you to a part of the clip i will call your attention to a, a small part those who saw the film you will know what you are seeing okay uh, others may watch again and try to understand what i am saying uh, so if you look at his face 
he is being beaten up and he looks so happy about being beaten up you understand usually when somebody is beaten up so brutally like that in the way francis is being beaten up uh, nobody could uh, laugh like this smile like this and that smile is coming from inside it's an inner joy that is flowing out you understand are you getting the point so it is the inner joy that is coming out so that is the experience of the sublime or the filmmaker is able to um, communicate or, or make us feel the same as you watch the whole film so that that is the uh, thing that i want to uh, express or i want to convey to you experience of the sublime yesterday we concluded after saying about the five principal sources of elevated language greatness of thought vigorous treatment of passion um skills in employing figures of thought and figures of speech noble diction and majesty and elevation of the structure so i just try to understand how these uh, these principles are being employed in this movie or any other movie which you may find not only in movie in a painting in a poetry in a novel in a story uh, there can be elements of the sublime which which erupts uh, and pervades the reader or viewer okay so that is the idea of sublime which ranjainus puts forward and the rest of the movie you may see i think this movie is available on youtube perhaps uh, so so if you want to watch the whole movie you can see it so sublimity is the echo of the great soul for the elevation of mind we have to nurture our souls to thoughts sublime and make them always pregnant say with noble inspiration so so the uh, it is the echo of the spirit echo of the great soul so we have to nurture our souls with noble inspirations and and keep our soul always pregnant with noble inspirations i hope this is clear to you so because it is coming from the inner soul of the author and it is uh, and the author or uh, film maker or artist will be able to cause the same kind of emotion to uh, come up also in the mind of the reader or in, in the mind of the viewer sublimity is the echo of the great soul for the elevation of mind we have to nurture our souls to thoughts sublime and make them always pregnant say with noble inspiration so so the uh, it is the echo of the spirit echo of the great soul so we have to nurture our souls with noble inspirations and and keep our soul always pregnant with noble inspirations so because it is coming from the inner soul of the author and it is uh, and the author or uh, film maker or artist will be able to cause the same kind of emotion to uh, come up also in the mind of the reader or in, in the mind of the viewer and it is different from amplification amplification is a discourse which invests the subject with grandeur uh, sublimity and uh, and and this definition however would surely apply in equal measure to sublimity and passion and figurative language since they is to invest a discourse with certain degree of grandeur uh, but the point of distinction between um, su- uh, sublimity and um, amplification sublimation and amplification is that sublimity consists in elevation while amplification uh, consists in multitude of details uh, so it is not about detailing a thing uh, too much in order to amplify it but it is about elevation of the soul elevation of the mind so that is the basic difference so amplification is about uh, giving too much detail multitude of details will be given about certain things in order to make it prominent but sublimation is it's about elevating it's about elevation of thought or language and amplification is universally associated with certain magnitude and abundance and another char- characteristic of sublimity is that sublimity raises the writers near to the majesty of god so the power of sublimity raises the writers or artists to close to the uh, majesty of god and they have a kind of uh, immunity from errors or censure it's a very simple thing to understand in most of his writing there, when there is a quality of sublime it it has an immunity from errors even if there is a small error 
no one will consider it as serious and, and nobody will be uh, daring to censure what he writes you understand so it elevates the artist or writer to the majesty of god you look at the entire literature written by plato aristotle homer you take any of them and you, and you consider all of their uh, writings so there can be some errors or uh, something that is uh, something that is not logical can be found sometimes if uh, someone uh, someone were to pick all those literature together uh, and uh, if we find out some errors in their writing the, the rest of their writing will be um, writing will be redeeming the failures which they have made so maybe you look at michael angelo there are so many beautiful works from him so many sculptures and paintings but even if there was an error in his work no one would consider that because the rest of his works redeem what he did as what he has done as an error uh, maybe may not be intentional or intentional uh, we don't consider what it is because michael angelo did it we agree with it because da vinci did this we don't we don't have any problem or critic of about that that kind of majesty they acquire through the simple touch of sublime a single sublime and happy touch and, and he writes like this if if one were to pick out and mass together the blunders of homer demosthenes plato and all the rest of the greatest writers they would be found to be very small part nay an infinite infinitesimal fraction of the triumphs which has uh, which those heroes achieve on every hand so whatever errors they have made they will be very very Uh, there will be only an infinitesimal part of the the glory they have achieved in the rest of their writings so sublimity raises the writers near to the majesty of god uh, when we consider sublime he also says that it is, though his work is mainly focusing on literature and rhetoric he says that uh, it um, it's a quality of greatness it can be physical it can be intellectual it can be moral spiritual artistic or metaphysical so the concept of the sublime it can be applied in every realm it is not limited to the realm of literature or um, rhetoric but it can be applied in every other realm it can be physical it can be intellectual it can be moral it can be a uh, spiritual artistic it can be metaphysical so it, it has a wider scope so in philosophy the sublime is a quality of greatness Uh, which can be physical intellectual moral spiritual artistic or metaphysical and another quality of sublime is that it is immeasurable it cannot be measured it cannot be calculated it cannot be imitated you understand when we agree with the mimetic theory of art we are imitating when we imitate something as it is there is a kind of measurement applied there so when you draw my hand you have a proportion to what you proportion when you draw it on a canvas uh, there has to be a proportion between the hand that is drawn there and hand uh, which which is actually here so so there is a kind of proportion and measurement but when it comes to sublime uh, he says it cannot be measured it is not measurable it cannot be calculated it cannot be imitated or measured it it has to come from within uh, it's a it's a uh, maybe it is a divine touch it's a sublime touch something beyond all such Uh, all usual or general kinds of uh, all general understanding about art or beauty it goes beyond that and he also puts forward uh, two reasons for the decline of art so the art may decline on two conditions so he makes his point about sublime lanjainus makes his points about sublime and he laments that decline of the oratory arts he speaks especially about oratory oratrics and its reason is twofold the reason for this decline is twofold it comes from the absence of freedom and number two the moral corruption the absence of freedom and moral corruption these two phenomena lanjainus reminds readers damages the high spirit which creates the sublime so it's a high spirit that creates the sublime so whenever there is a moral corruption whenever there is uh, no freedom it damages the high spirit which uh, creates the sublime and it is very true about art also very often we hear to something like uh, 
फ्रीडम ऑफ एक्सप्रेशन बींग आर्टिस्ट वी एक्चुअली नीड फ्रीडम ऑफ एक्सप्रेशन सो वेन वी डू नॉट हैव फ्रीडम ऑफ एक्सप्रेशन आर्ट विल डिक्लाइन द क्वालिटी ऑफ द आर्ट विल डिक्लाइन एंड द सब्लाइम विल नॉट बी नो सब्लाइम कैन बी क्रिएटेड इन एन एटमोस्फियर वेर देर इज नो फ्रीडम वेर देर इज मॉरल करप्शन इट इज वेरी ऑब्वियस वेन वेन देर इज अ फास्टिस्ट रेजीम दे विल बी टारजेटिंग आर्टिस्ट देर विल बी नो फ्रीडम ऑफ एक्सप्रेशन दे विल वॉन्ट ऑल द आर्टिस्ट टू प्रेज द ग्लोरी ऑफ द गवर्नमेंट it can affect art also so when you are practicing art when you don't have the freedom to express yourself express your thought it affects and moral corruption when an artist is morally corrupted again the decline can happen okay so so they, these are the reasons for decline of art Jainus. So, uh, one problem with the concept of the sublime is that it is not having just one meaning. It is important to note that the use of the English word sublime and all its philosophical associations that accompany arise from multiple translations. But the word means the essentials of noble and impressive style. That is the that is that may be a meaning. Uh, generally, that is the meaning. the essentials of a noble and impressive style but the meaning of the word and also the philosophical understanding of the um, term sublime it comes from multiple translations so so there is a kind of ambiguity about the term okay and the second part is longinus himself is speaking about the sublime and longinus writing seems like Uh, it is rarely considered as a perfect kind of writing or even sublime so it is not a sublime thing to read it is not an interesting read when we read when we read periupsos by longinus we will not have the feeling of the sublime he is talking too much about the sublime but his own writing does not give us the feeling of the sublime uh, partly because he is too zealous over zealous uh, enthusiasm when we look at his way of writing he is over zealous and enthusiastic uh, and this leads to a hyperbole or uh, over statement from his part so he is maybe a kind of play of words he is uh, saying too many things about one thing uh, uh, saying from one side and from the other side the same thing uh, saying in different ways the same thing so so it becomes a kind of boring text reading a boring text so it's an over statement or hyperbole from his part Longinus is also criticized for writing tediously in the book on the sublime. So there is a critic of the sublime. And we need to understand one more thing how this notion has made its impact in history of art. In the beginning of the lecture I mentioned uh, this text was discovered in the uh, 16th century early 16th century and in the mid 16th century it was printed and it became very popular. And in the 16th century this was published by Francis Robertello in Basel Francis Robertello So Francis Robertello in Basel published it in 16th century and after a few years it was again published by Nicolas da Falgano And in 1600s the concept of reaching the sublime became becomes an becomes the major goal of baroque literature and also in baroque art attaining the quality of sublime becomes very important for the writers and also artists so since then uh, on the sublime has received more attention with each passing century so the book of longinus on the sublime it has received a great attention from the time of renaissance ever since it was published its at its focus um, or its importance was increasing over the centuries so this one is actually 
actually the, the image of annunciation it doesn't exist uh, it's a copy of the reverse in engraving and actually this was uh, painted in a church so uh, um, maybe the style is naturalistic but it is not realistic so suppose this was a decoration in the church so uh, what would be the feeling of somebody who enters there who enters in the church annunciation with god father god the father angels and sibyls a copy in reverse of the engraving by cornelius scott after the fresco by federico succaro so it was a it was a work in a church by federico succaro so what he is trying to achieve in in a church that is decorated in this manner when a believer enters uh, they want to give a feeling of sublime a feeling of being elevated in their thought in their in their feelings uh, they need they want to elevate the viewers and uh, i i will suggest you a reading uh, if you go to tate.org.uk uh you will understand how how the concept of sublime how the concept of sublime is uh, taking over in the centuries in the in the centuries that follow so this is the website the art of the, means if you remind me i will also provide this web, uh, link uh, url in our classroom so the art of the sublime what is sublime british art and the sublime the sublimations of christian art the baroque sublime the romantic sublime the victorian sublime the modern sublime the contemporary sublime so these are different articles that is published in tate website so it is a, it, you will find it on tate website i want all of you to go and read this in order to understand this concept and here is a reading for you if you want you can have an extra reading the other one i wish all of you have to read this one if you want to know more uh, capturing the sublime italian drawings of renaissance and baroque it's about the renaissance and baroque sublime and his church why why they are decorating it in this manner means uh, when a fa- when a believer enters the church they want to feel like uh, uh, like they are they are in a different world okay beyond the natural world so they were trying to a- achieve the quality of sublime in the periods after renaissance uh, whether it is baroque whether it is rococo and the definition of sublime changes over time more philosophers come in and they explore the meaning of the sublime and the understanding of longinus as we under, know is very shallow but uh, later philosophers like schopenhauer immanuel kant uh, lovejoy arthur lovejoy so there are many philosophers who work on the concept of sublime and and uh, they they figure out that uh, they give a more deeper understanding of the concept of sublime so that is the discussion on the sublime okay so do you have some questions any doubts and some of the concepts that is developed in the modern times we will be seeing in the next semester when we look at some other philosophers okay so this becomes an introduction for the concept of sublime and uh, you can read on it more and we will look look at some of the philosophers in the next semester